Hello, and I'd like to welcome you to our session today for Sport and Physical Activity, an update webinar for sessions, work-based learning, private training providers, really just to give them an overview of some of the things that we're doing and we're looking at moving into the next part of the year. So with myself, Gareth Reynolds, who's the Product Manager for Sport and Physical Activity, and I'd also like to welcome Andy Pollard, uh, who is our Senior EPA Delivery Manager. How are you doing, Andy? Good, thanks, Gareth. Fantastic. And thanks for joining us today. I know it's a great opportunity for us to share some information with uh, colleagues and centres uh, that may be interesting, interested around new parts of the offer, things that have come new into the sector or things that they're currently delivering, just to inform that planning moving forward. OK, so some of the things that we're going to cover today is, as I've already said, is some of those key updates within the sector also like to touch upon and, and really sort of explore those level two industry skills for colleagues that are maybe not aware of what they are or have kind of heard about them but thinking about how they could use and implement them because we've seen a, a greater uptake within the sector uh, within different centers looking at these and using them in different ways so we can touch on a couple of those things there also like to make you aware of some of our digital solutions that may reinforce support that offer directly or indirectly support other parts of your own offers and to be repurposed and also critically some major updates with our EPA offer really in sport and physical activity which is really excited about that we can share uh, and Andy's uh, going to explore some of those things around that that you might like to know a little bit more about and and where to go next where you can go after listening to this this recorded webinar. So some of the things that we're going to touch on when we look at the offer is something around the map standards around industry skills, particularly thinking about SIMSPA and the Institute of Outdoor Learning. Um, also flagged the BTEC Sporting Goals webinar series, although aligned to some of the BTEC offer, there's lots of bits in there around the wider industry. So we have a specific podcast with SIMSPA, for example. So if you are thinking about industry standards and thinking, okay, how did this relate to me, my offer, our applicants, the people that are gonna take this offer up, um, actually there might be some bits there that you want to look at to explore, either to share with colleagues, um, look at yourself, or also share with potential learners on program with you. Um, also for centers that are listening in, we do have a bilingual offer uh, across the Welsh medium as well, and that might be something that some centres might want to consider. The new EPAs, as I've already said, and that digital solution. So firstly, the, the level two industry skills. We've had a, an offer here really since September last year, but obviously in terms of coming into play and centres looking at this and really being actively involved, this is where we're seeing the most traction in terms of this year. And, and really, what, what do we mean by industry, industry skills? Well, there's four qualifications in this suite. And of those four qualifications, each one of them is mapped to an industry standard, a professional standard. So essentially that means the learner that can completes that qualification is going to be certified, signed off to undertake that role in the industry. So once they've completed the qualification that you would offer to them, and it's gone through all the appropriate processes, they're able then to sign up with SIMSPA, become a member and claim that professional standard. So that gives real value as opposed to qualification, learning, getting a feel for some fundamentals. They're gonna be doing that, but also getting that real tangible enabling that employability and stepping into the industry and also knowing that it fulfills the needs of the industry, the workforce, employers, etc. So we have a really nice suite in that offer that we've brought into play. Now, I'm not going to go into massive detail into each, really this is around the awareness and there will be links out to these when you come to look at the slides for this session. But as you can see there, we've got the brackets next to them, instructing circuit training, instructing exercise and group in a group environment, leading children's sports activities and that recreational assistance. So straight away, we can start to see the synergies with roles in the industry that learners or yourself would have offered historically in those spaces. So really thinking about what, where that fits with your offer, where does that fit maybe with your local context? Do you already have a relationship with a leisure center? Is there something there that could be offered in terms of that pipeline, that roll on roll off? We've developed a work-based learning or placed these into a work-based learning 
standardization model so that you can have that roll on roll off maybe slightly bit bigger than the mvqs we might have offered in this space in the past however those mvqs are not mapped to standards so this is the offer that really permeates and is important for your learners having that purpose and those real outcomes so 360 looking at different ways around that might be offered that could be offered in a really intense period or over a a couple of months or a summer period or however your cycle works you've really got the flexibility to use that there hands-on skills learning the fundamentals but critically applying them and doing what the industry wants and needs to fulfill those map standards as you would expect with those that they're funded uh, for adult learners also, we have the resources there to support you around that as well. And there's some flags there to what some of those things are. But on our qualification website, you can delve deeper into them. And as I said, we do explore those deeper as well within our Sporting Goals webinar. This document here we can find on the website, but I've just sort of flagged it for you really just to outline where these standards sit in there. So on the left hand side, what we can see across those level two industry skills is, for example, with a group instructor, that is group exercise instructor. That is the standard that that learner, that successful completer of that qualification will be able to apply for and gain on successful completion of that qualification. So what we're doing is we're really giving learners what they need to be able to do that role in the industry. And for those that are not familiar or aware, SIMSPA now look after what was reps. So all of those sort of historic older qualifications are now being phased out. And this is where learners need to be. And in terms of the offer, our integrity of our offer and the meaningfulness and the ability for learners to apply in the industry, they need to have those SIMSPA standards. And we've also put there the sort of did you know linking out to something that is really sort of useful in terms of using these in a sector. We know that lots of local authorities local context is off these sports sports clubs coaching clubs whether that's during school time after school time uh, summer clubs summer camps the leading children's sports activity has the specialism of working in the school's environment outside of the curriculum which is a requirement for that funding for primary schools to be able to engage with that. So again, if you're looking at what you want to offer in that space, if that's somewhere you want to step into, or actually you're looking to iterate and evolve your offer, these are qualifications that I would really strongly recommend that you take a look at. And if there's something there that has a resonance with you, please make contact with us. On the right hand side, that's our level three offer, which really wouldn't necessarily sit in this space. There are opportunities and, and you could use that in the space. You'd probably see that more so in an FE college or a sixth form. However, what you can see from that illustration on the page is how each of these qualifications are mapped to those standards and that progression, progression there as well. So if you do have some candidates that come in and work with you at level two and they think, actually, I do want to go back into education, they can then articulate onto these as well. So there might be something there around that. We can also see the additional endorsements and mapping of the UKAD, uh, the anti-doping agency um, and also the Institute for Outdoor Learning, which is more so at level three as well, but that will link onto the EPAs that we come onto in a moment. Don't know, Andy, if there's anything on that I've just been through that you, you'd like to sort of amplify or anything that I could make clearer? Just with regards to the industry skills, yes. um, once centres are approved to deliver, you will get notified of who your standards verifier is using Excel online. And as you mentioned, because the qualifications can be delivered in a range of um, sort of mediums, speak with your SV, let your, S, uh, your standards verifier and your lead standards verifier know your intentions to make sure that sampling can be identified at an appropriate point for, for your centre and not delay certification. Great. And yeah, the, that's really useful. And thank you for that. So the pragmatics of centres being able to arrange that and making sure that each of those given cohorts, as soon as they're completed and they're ready, can be, be deployed, essentially. So yeah, that is critical. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I just wanted to, again, just highlight awareness around the digital solution. You may have heard or seen elements around the learning hub. Uh, and really, this is just an opportunity to show that what we've got here is there's a lot of content 
around the qualifications that you would offer at level two or any bite-sized qualifications or introduction to learning or linked directly to qualifications. So on this right-hand side, for example, we can see unit A. So the, the unit A links specifically to our level three qualifications. However, if we break that down, we can see the modules actually that that's irrelevant. That can be repurposed totally for whatever your learning is. So we have a number of centers that are delivering the level two industry skills that are, are doing that the fitness one for example that saying okay c2 the fitness skills development there's solutions and content within that which would be really valuable for learners that we're engaging with that actually our face-to-face -face is quite limited that's when we're going to be coming in and really doing things the hand on hands on things the good stuff if you like in the gym understanding all the movements the equipment your safety um instruction but can we flip some of that learning can we have a blended model can we give the learners an opportunity to do some of this learning before they come into that face-to-face -face engagement so this really helps with obviously lots of narrative and discussion around blended learning digital learning independent learning flip learning however you wish to use this however this supports your given model this is going to give you capacity and also give learners the opportunity to take independence see where their gaps are undertake the learning at a time that suits them and also enables them to make progress as well and also built into this we've got lots of different features but we've also got elements around checking your learning some more summative type assessment practice which again will enable you to see their progress and, and inform them as well so some of the points that i touched on there around independent learning that remote access they can use this platform on any given device uh, and it's going to track and enable them to kind of tap into that whenever they are uh, we know that most of most of our learners are going to have really busy lives they, they, they might be working they might might have their own child care um, there's lots of different things that they may be doing they may be maybe a carer actually when can they do some of this learning they can do this on a bus with their headphones and their mobile device they they can do it after a training session they can do it in between uh, at their lunch break at work maybe take 15 minutes out to do some of this learning and each one of those given rows on that right hand side is a block of learning something that they can really engage with and, and, and go over as many times as they feel is, is appropriate for them whether that's directly linked to assessment or also to inform their career journey because it's very much about them being enabled to undertake those roles in the industry so there are lots of repurposed opportunities here for those level two industry skills and that document that you can see there on the right hand side specifically in the back of that we give some suggestions of some of the units that could be repurposed for those level two industry skills so if you are looking for a solution to really help you maximize that time away from face to face or being undertaken virtually i really uh, uh, suggest that you you have a look at this and see if there's value there for you and your delivery model as i've already said there's a number of centers that are looking at this some that have already applied this for these level two industry skills so there is value there for you Um, and what we've got through this is just some of those key features that you, you might like to think about. Okay, how can I use this? How can I apply this? As I said, we've got those checks on learning. We've got those end of module summaries. And also, which I quite like as well in terms of thinking about putting into practice, we've got an end of module sort of reflection. And what that does is for that learning, it helps a learner identify what skills they've taken out that they can apply moving forward. So it's not just about content. It's about skills, knowledge, knowledge and behavior which is going to inform and empower that workforce both for them and also supplement that delivery model that you're undertaking as well really thought about accessibility there as well so we've got the audio we've got videos we've got a range of sort of pdfs just to be taken out for people to undertake them in their own time but a range of different stimulus and mediums so that we are accessing that whole learning profile and also moving away from something that might be quite tedium in terms of just working for a textbook for example and also it's there it gives the flexibility on demand access as and when is appropriate and uh, purposeful for that learner undertaking that block of learning and supporting your delivery model. Okay, and uh, just mindful, I've, I've shot for a couple of things there in terms of that, that digital solution. Um, is there anything there that sticks out to you specifically or anything you'd like to reiterate? I think for me, the main thing for the digital solution is it can be used for a stretch and challenge and independent learning. And when we're, as you mentioned, we're preparing learners for um, their future, 
having those independent learning skills and being disciplined to log on, undertake a couple of key activities that will give them a really good sort of um, a really good uh, sense of taking ownership of their learning and going forward. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think one of the things that I didn't mention there for colleagues to think about as well is that there's a range of analytics behind that. So actually, if you want to kind of look at the amount of time that they're spending or even log that. But the reason why I mentioned that is feeding into Andy's point is that we can help build a culture and say, OK, um, you know, you've got this tool here. I can see that you've you've only engaged with it a little bit. Is there an opportunity where you can use this a little bit more? I can see you've, you've done really well in the assessments on that one. You said that was a strength and it really was. Uh, this one over here, which you, you, you feel is a strength in terms of your outcomes, don't seem to be as high. So maybe that's where your focus needs to be. So it helps you create a culture as a deliverer. But also it really informs a learner, like you say, in terms of stretch and challenge, if they want to delve deeper and go down that rabbit hole and spend more time on it they really can but also on the flip side of that if it's something that they feel okay i've covered this we've gone through it i'm still struggling with it it gives them the opportunity to go over it without raising it in front of class maybe multiple times and revisiting it because they've got the content and the solution there to really apply themselves and give them that autonomy as, as you've suggested there andy okay so in terms of endpoint assessment as I, as I mentioned at the top, sort of a really exciting time, I think, for the sport and physical activity sector. Um, centres may be aware of this sport and excellence professional, which is quite nuanced in terms of who can access and, and undertake that. As it says in the title, sport and excellence professional, there's, there's a smaller sort of market that can undertake that qualification. Um, so we often see that around professional foot cl football clubs which is a huge uptake, but that, that's available in a number of other sports in terms of the, the images that, that we've got there, you'll be able to see. So rugby union, rugby league, um, uh, cricket, where, where we feel that there's opportunities there. That standard is available. In terms of our offer, what we're seeing at the moment is, is around football and rugby. So centres that are a, eligible to deliver that probably would be aware of that. And that's something we've delivered in the space for, for quite a while now. Um, but in the last year, there's been a real sort of opportunity in sport and physical activity with the development of sports coach. Uh, Simpsburg were highly involved with that in terms of development around that. And now we have this standard that offers free pathways in terms of high performance school sports and also community. And as I've already mentioned, that there is a whole ecosystem of sports clubs, sports activity, physical activity, uh, health and well-being, movement um skills development all of these different things that are happening all and around but now there's a standard to really support that and those three different pathways enable people to specialize but link very much from whether something they've uh, learned and studied at college or at school or they've had experience in in the industry now they can put that into practice in, in a given standard um andy i don't know if you wanted to just sort of expand at all on that sports coach i know that there's a lot of interest and it's something as i said for me really excites me and i think there's lots of opportunity there it is particularly for our sports offer as you mentioned the sports and excellence professional sports coach and soon the outdoor learning specialist what we're seeing with the sports coaches is a lot of engagement and a lot of discussion around which um which pathway would be most appropriate for my apprentices and that's one of the benefits of sports coach in terms of contextualising. Apprentices do have to adhere to the knowledge, skills and behaviours of the assessment plan, but it's within the context of their own role. So again, we're improving quality within the sector. We're making sure that apprentices are being assessed for the standard that they're registered against. And we're now going to the sort of the EPA and the S360 and the, the nuts and bolts of it you'll be able to see why it's why it's really important to have that early engagement way before the gateway point to make sure that apprentices and employers and training providers are as best prepared as possible to achieve a distinction. Great. Um, yeah, as you say, we're, we're going to go into that detail in a moment, but in terms of the interest around those pathways, 
there's been for me there's been a huge gap for that sports coach offer and the fact that it's there and, and Simpsborough have been involved and and linking to those level two industry skills as well we speak we're going to be speaking the same language learners are going to understand the same sort of terminology and there's going to be real sort of pathways routes synergy and understanding within the sector moving forward and as you said Andy the, the outdoor learning specialist um on, on the register, uh, Pearson, we're on the register for that. It's a very, very new sort of launch standard. We, we are, are the first EPAO on the register for that um, and, and working very closely with IOL who uh, were instrumental in the development of that standard. Also, we've got sort of a, a rich sort of history of working with them around our level three industry skills as well. Um, our career focused, if you like, around our sports and outdoor offer. So that really pleased to be able to offer that. And that outdoor learning specialist is just such a sort of plethora and wealth of opportunities for that to be applied in. Uh, and the fact that it's at level five as well, real sort of career articulation and opportunities for apprentices looking in that space. Um, we know the benefit of health and well-being that's going to come through with all three of these offers sports coach is a real opportunity there but that outdoor really taps into something else as well and there'll be certain locations around the country where this is going to resonate even more strongly in terms of utilizing that wealth of outdoor space uh, and the benefits that it can offer to, to a local community and beyond so I think what we'll do now, Andy, is if we just move on to the section, as you've already alluded to, just so we can give a bit more of an understanding of, OK, yes, I really want to deliver an EPA. That makes sense. As you said, have those early conversations. But what does it then look like? What happens next? Thanks, Gareth. So as you mentioned in one of your previous slides with regards to employment assessment, where before anything can happen, you will need to have a contract of engagement with Pearson to deliver employment assessment for your apprentices on behalf of your employers. So if you're an existing Pearson Centre, the first thing to do is contact your account specialist, explain to them that you're interested in adding employment assessment to your existing offer. And then what they will do is they will organise a onboarding uh, session with you. And that onboarding session will talk you through the, the differences to endpoint assessment with regards to qualifications, BTECs, work-based learning. Once you have your contract set up, this will then allow you to be onboarded by ACE 360. So ACE 360 is our EPA management information system. And that is the system that we use for every aspect of endpoint assessment. And I'll touch on S360 in a lot more detail in one of the later slides. You may be aware that we have been allowed some flexibilities and dispensations. Now, one thing to bear in mind is throughout the COVID pandemic, we were working as part of a task group with Ofqual, with IFIT, with the relevant external quality assurance bodies to identify additional assessment methods which would allow apprentices to undertake endpoint assessment but still maintain that validity and safe assessment practice. Now for the sporting sectors, we were permitted in Sports and Excellence Professional to have a flexibility allowing us to use recordings because within the Sports and Excellence Professional observation component where we have five discrete elements, the face-to-face -face observation could not be done. Clubs quite rightly were on lockdown. They were only allowing um, limited numbers of staff in. So we spoke with Ofqual, we spoke with IFA, we spoke with employer representatives and we agreed that the face-to-face 60-minute practical training session observation can be replaced with practical footage. So that is digital footage of a minimum of 45 minutes and it must capture all of the knowledge, skills and behaviours that the practical training uh, session requires. Similarly, with the debrief session, because independent endpoint assessors couldn't go to club and they couldn't observe the coach giving feedback to the apprentice. 
we were permitted to uh, assess a recording. Now, one thing to bear in mind is all of these fle flexibilities and dispensations are on a standard by standard basis. So in December, IFA reviewed all of the flexibilities and removed some, extended some, and then gave specific target dates for completion on others. So as I mentioned, within the, the sporting sectors and the sporting standards that we, we offer, there is only the Sporting Excellence Professional where we have a current dispensation. Now IFA have um, allowed a few more flexibilities. So these are overarching. So these are more process driven. Some of these relate to gateway sign-offs being done remotely, whereas previously gateway meetings between the apprentice, the employer and the training provider would all be done face-to-face -face in the room. IFA have allowed or encouraged gateway sign-offs to be done remotely through the use of Teams, Zoom, Google Meet. One other area to consider is the use of signatures. So we are permitted to use digital signatures in lieu of wet signatures. On IFA's web page, under the flexibility framework, this is where it tells you which of the flexibilities are being retained as options. So there is a key date with IFA and that is the 1st of April. So we're three weeks in and seven of the 10 flexibilities have been retained. So these are observations taking place in simulated environments, remote delivery of assessment, including invigilation, Pause has been allowed between assessment methods, assessments taking place outside of usual venues, delivery of assessment methods in any order, exams and tests being online instead of on paper, and then, as I mentioned, the gateway sign off. Now, one other point just to bear in mind is during COVID times, the attempt level two functional skills rule had been relaxed, meaning if the assessment plan required apprentices to achieve functional skills level one, but then also provide evidence that they have attempted level two, that rule has now been removed. So for the standards that Gareth's mentioned earlier, the sport and excellence professional, sports coach, and the outdoor learning specialist, that rule would not apply. But if you're working on other standards with Pearson or any other endpoint assessment organisation, such as customer services, that rule has been removed. So evidence is required that the apprentice has attempted level two functional skills. If we can move on to the next slide, Gareth, please. So I just wanted to draw your attention to some of the ESFA funding rules. Now we know we're sort of part way through the year, but it's important to remember that one of the rules which was introduced in August 2021 was that endpoint assessment organisations must be made aware of apprentices entering EPA with at least six months notice. So we need a minimum of six months notice to be able to forecast and plan independent endpoint assessors to make sure that they are available for when you need assessment. We understand that things change. We understand that apprentices do have breaks in learning. But the key to remember, and from a data accuracy perspective, is if things change, update it on ACE 360 at the same time. As I mentioned, ACE 360 is the system we use for gateways for assessments, for quality assurance, for uh, results and for certification. If you build into your process during tracking meetings or standardization meetings, where you're looking at your cohort of apprentices and the expected gateway date is, is going, needs to be changed, update it there and then. One of the other things to bear in mind is that employers should be selecting the employment assessment organisation. 
Now, I know many of you as training providers will be speaking with employers and employers will be saying, OK, so what are my options? If you've got an employer that wants to speak to Pearson, by all means, get in touch with us and we will speak with the employer. We'll explain our offer and we'll explain what support we can offer. And then finally, the reference to functional skills, qualification, temporary flexibilities. So this was back last year when there was teacher assessed grades. As a reminder, that has now ended. There is an expectation that all apprentices do have access to functional skills, English and maths. And with the use of remote proctoring or um, the face-to-face -face invigilation, there should be no barrier now for apprentices to progress and achieve their functional skills. If we go on to the next slide, Gareth. So as I mentioned at the start of, of my slides, ACE360 is the system that we use. You may be familiar with edXL Online. So with edXL Online, you will be registering learners it's the same on S360. It's an online platform which allows you to register apprentices in readiness for employment assessment. It will also show you all the key stages of your apprentice's EPA journey. Within the system, it is dynamic. So if you upload an apprentice and progress them to Gateway, once an independent endpoint assessor has reviewed the gateway evidence, your system updates automatically. So there is no sort of like 24 hour delay, it is instant. It gives clear visibility of each of the different apprentice stages. So you will be able to see from a tracking and monitoring perspective how many apprentices are still in training, how many apprentices have a gateway in progress. How many apprentices have been gateway approved? How many apprentices are approved for endpoint assessment? And how many apprentices have a positive uh, endpoint assessment grade attached? We also use the booking and scheduling. So from the AS360 system, once apprentices are moved into the approved for endpoint assessment, you can then make a booking within the system to say, okay, apprentice one would like their endpoint assessment on a Friday morning. You can provide additional notes in terms of, it has to be 8 a.m. due to work commitments. And that information will get passed directly to your independent endpoint assessor to enable a planning meeting and pre-assessment discussion. It also helps with trust with employers. So when employers are saying, okay, what's happening with my apprentices? You can show them on the system. Okay, 10 of the 15 apprentices have gone through a gateway. 10 of the apprentices have a booking confirmed. And then once the endpoint assessment has happened, you will then be able to share within the notification of results. So within the system, it allows independent endpoint assessors to upload their assessment documents. And within the apprentice record, this will show you the, the result per component, overall grade, and also a timeline of when the certificate will be requested. Within the system, it does talk directly with the ESFA. So after a period of 30 days, post assessment, ACE will request the apprentice certificate directly from the ESFA using the information that you have provided on the apprentice record. Now, one of the um, features ACE have introduced in the last couple of months is if an apprentice has changed employer, for example, you can update the employer address and the certificate will be sent to the new employer. Or if the apprentice is working from home for whatever reason, 
you can request that the certificate is sent to the printer's home address. Go on to the next slide, Gareth. So just diving a little bit deeper into the tracking and monitoring of S360. Within each of the apprentice records, you will be able to see at what stage the apprentice is at. So on the screen, you can see a bar graph detailing apprentice's progress. The key stages that we look at for all apprentices is whether they're in training, whether gateway evidence has been complete, whether the gateway has been approved, whether the apprentice is EPA ready, and then it moves into EPA progress, EPA passed and grade determined. So the way ACE360 works is you as the training provider will start off with full access to the apprentice record. That will allow you to upload gateway evidence such as functional skills, any mandatory qualifications, gateway declarations. If the record is open to you as the provider, it is locked to Pearson. So we can't see anything until you have completed your activity. Once all the gateway evidence has been uploaded, you then need to do a final gateway confirmation. So it's a gateway submission. At that point, the apprentice record will become locked to you, but unlocked to Pearson. So then we can review each of the gateway components. If all the gateway components are accurate, in line with the assessment plan and our EPA resource pack, we will approve the apprentice for endpoint assessment. So the system self audits all the way through. In terms of any mistakes, because we know that mistakes do happen, Say, for example, you upload a functional skills level one certificate rather than a level two. Within the system, it will identify that there is a problem with a particular gateway component, in this case, functional skills. There will be a message to say, we need to see evidence of functional skills level two, and then we will deny EPA on that basis. Now, denying EPA does not mean that we won't progress the apprentice through to endpoint assessment. It just means at that moment in time, we can't move forward because the gateway requirements have not been met. Within the system, any of the issues will be located on your dashboard. So it's a one click. You can see if there is any problems or any issues. Only when the apprentice has moved into the, the proof for EPA status, meaning that the gateway evidence has been checked and confirmed, that's when you can request the endpoint assessment using the booking and scheduling tool. So if we go on to the next slide, I'm just going to share with you some of the service level agreements. So once you have confirmed overall gateway readiness for an apprentice, Within 72 hours, the Pearson Independent Endpoint Assessor will review the evidence and confirm whether the apprentice can progress into the EPA period or whether additional evidence is required. In terms of bookings, we do need to have a minimum of five working days notice. As I mentioned at the start of these slides, because we're asking for at least six months notice of the future apprentices and future gateway dates, having the information accurate at the start allows my team to forecast. So if we're forecasting six months from now, that will be towards the end of October, we will have assessors ready to undertake the assessments because you've told us when an apprentice will be ready for endpoint assessment. Our standard contractual um, assessment dates are within six to eight weeks. However, with the flexibilities that we have been allowed by IFAID of Qual, we are typically seeing assessments happen within a period of two to three weeks. With the face-to-face -face activities, 
So for the sports coach and outdoor learning specialist, please bear in mind that there may be a delay um, with independent employment assessors undertaking face-to-face -face activities. But if there is any delays, we will let you know. In terms of feedback, five working days after the last EPA component has been assessed, we will then provide a notification of results, which will be attached to the apprentice record, detailing performance strengths. And if an apprentice has not achieved, so therefore got to fail, we will give you specific um, justifications on the criteria are awarded. Next slide, Gareth, please. So within this, there are a couple of reporting functions. The first one being the workload report. So again, if you're dealing with self-assessment reports or quality improvement plans, the workload report will be able to identify how many apprentices are in each of the different statuses. And because the system is dynamic, if you were tracking and monitoring on a weekly basis or even a monthly basis, you can download the report and then you can track your perform uh, your progress of your apprentice cohorts. So this is really useful um, when you're profiling apprentices for funding or if you're going for um, new tenders, new contracts with employers, you've got the data to hand. And then the next slide is where we're looking at grade distributions. So this will show your grade history over a period of 12 months. So you can drill down into specific standards, or if you wanted to look at it on a sector by sector basis, the system will show you your distinction rate, your pass rate, and your overall pass rate. So again, it's really useful to help standardize your assessors who are, who are preparing apprentices for employment assessment, but also from a quality assurance uh, perspective, you can identify which assessors have got the most distinctions and then use those assessors to sort of upskill other, other new assessors or assessors who seem to be getting a lot of fails. So it is an analysis tool which can help you. So just a couple of reminders in terms of what to expect during endpoint assessment. So I mentioned we need five working days uh, as a minimum when using the booking and scheduling tool. Now, the reason for that is independent endpoint assessors need to hold a planning meeting with the apprentice and the employer. So the purpose of the planning meeting is to confirm logistics, understand the context of the apprentice's job role and answer any questions the apprentice or employer has. On the day of assessment, the independent endpoint assessor will undertake a pre-assessment briefing with the apprentice undertake each assessment component for the time specified. But one key thing to bear in mind is no feedback will be provided on the day. Now, the reason for that is independent endpoint assessors are acting in an examiner capacity. They will watch the apprentice, they will listen to the apprentice, they will assess the apprentice. And when they're away from the apprentice and the employer, that is where they will be formulating their grade. Following assessment, so five working days after the last assessment component has been completed, there will be a notification of results. If there are any questions or queries on the result, please come back to EPA delivery at Pearson.com. Independent endpoint assessors are not allowed to engage in conversation post assessment. The reason being, independent endpoint assessors need to be removed from the assessment process. So, 
they are not allowed to be involved prior to employment assessment. So they can't have any dealings in the apprentices in training. They are there as an examiner. In terms of support, so we've got a range of support services should you need this. So we do have the Steps to Success web page. So this is where we will be populating short videos, short clips on how to do um, a range of different activities. Within S360, we do have something called the Knowledge Base. This is where we'll be storing any frequently asked questions, documents, and examiner style reports. So with these examiner style reports, the lead internal quality assurer for the standard will be providing a summary of all performance from providers over the last 12 months. And the aim is to identify any sort of key themes or key trends and offer suggestions to help improve and support apprentices reach those high, those high distinction rates. We do have a lead IQA for the standard, and he will be responsible to sort of clarify or provide advice and guidance on particular grade criteria. There are various peers and teams, so you have the customer services, you'll have your account specialist, EPA delivery. We are starting to include detail in the sort of like the work-based learning newsletters. So one thing to bear in mind with the newsletters is you do need to opt in. So if you have never opted in before and you're a Pearson customer, speak to your account manager. They can do that on your behalf or on the hyperlink, you will be able to click straight through and register. As we start uh, developing and going through the assessment cycle, particularly for sports coach and outdoor learning specialist, once the development is complete, we will be producing sort of past sector webinar recordings, similar to this one you're listening to now. We'll be building up a bank of resources. And then finally, we've got the customer services portal. If there is anything else that you do need assistance with, So just to give you a flavour of what is coming in this year. So we are working on a number of uh, standards. Some have been completed, some are still work in progress. So as Gareth mentioned, Sports Coach is live and we're ready to accept apprentices. We've got some of the children and young people sector, so the early years lead practitioner level five, teaching assistant level three, the outdoor learning specialist, that is one of the new EPAs in development. And then on the right hand side, we've got some of the data and another health standard. So as I mentioned previously, if you're interested in any of these EPAs or any of our existing offer, the best thing to do is contact your account specialist. And then finally, we are recruiting for independent employment assessors on the sports coach and outdoor learning specialist standards. So if you'd like to get involved, I've put the hyperlink there, which will direct you straight to the job description. This can be done uh, alongside a part-time, full-time role if you're in, in centre, but it will also give you an insight to what endpoint assessment is and how to best prepare your apprentices. Great. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Andy. Some really useful tips there for people to consider and also help them with that next step of the process. As you alluded to throughout, we've got the web pages that 
go over the process, uh, some that visualize that as well. Also, we can go into each of the, the EPAs in the specific standards and, and gain some more detail around what, what that looks and feels like around each of the specific assessments. So everything is there for people to make that informed decision and then to reach out and have those conversations to, to empower them to make the next steps with their offer. Um, so yes, really like to thank you for your time on this session today. Hopefully that's been of use and value uh, to listeners. And if there's anything further we can help with, please use those links. Um, please sign up to the work-based learning newsletter, the, the insights newsletter, which will give you all of those things on the horizon or bits that can help you in real time as well. So thank you very much.